Okay, so today we're talking to Peter Galloway, who's a retired captain of the Royal Navy. Um, th firstly, Peter, thank you for letting us talk to you today. My pleasure. Um, you've got an extensive career, but you've kindly said that you would talk about a very small part of your career, which was the Falklands conflict. So, um, really, I'm just going to ask you to sort of gently speak about what you can recollect and your memories of that, you know, any sort of poignant moments or anything that you feel that the local people would be interested in. Okay, um, well of course Glamorgan was quite an old ship in 1982 um, and I was a young commander, I was 38 and <clears throat> I hadn't got much experience of this particular type of ship so I joined in March of 82 which was literally a month before the Argentinians invaded. I had five officers working for me, um, about 17 chief petty officers, 16 petty officers and the rest were leading hands and below and we also used to employ about 10 seamen who, who were part of the missile and gunnery teams so roughly a crew working for on the, the weapons side of about 110 people. So you were the weapons engineer and officer? Correct. Okay. Uh, ship's company was about 540, don't quote me on the exact numbers, um, the ship, big ship, five and a uh, half thousand tons, 550 feet roughly. Uh, but steel, which comes into the story a bit later, tough ship. We had spent a few weeks uh, testing this and getting ready for a big exercise off Gibraltar, which involved firing missiles at aerial targets and testing our big sea slug missile, which is a two-ton Mark II missile. The ship was uh, built to accommodate 30 of these missiles. Imagine at 60 tons of missiles and they were laid in next to each other all the way down the center line of the ship about 15 to 20 feet above sea level and the significance of that will become apparent later because of the dreaded exocet we knew all about exocet because we had exocet on board we knew the argentinians had exocet and it's an odd missile which was beginning to preoccupy me um, as we found out the Argentinians had invaded. Now the way we found out was quite amusing. Um, I, I mentioned the incident in my book, I don't need to revisit it now, except to say that Admiral Fieldhouse happened to be on board the ship operating off Gibraltar with a lot of Type 42 destroyers and we, we in Glamorgan were doing rather better with our old sea slug than they were with their modern sea dart. So we were pretty pleased. We were shooting down targets and they weren't. Um, um, they had technical problems, but all ships do. So we were quite pleased with ourselves and the Admiral was on board. We found out, in fact, that the Argentinians invaded when his flag lieutenant interrupted the Sunday night film and asked to borrow Jane's fighting ships. And he was uh, whisked off in the helicopter very quickly back to Northwood, and that was the last we saw of him until, would you believe, he came on board when we returned. Even talking about returning makes me sort of well up a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we immediately turned south with the other ships that were going to become part of the task force, and the, the ships that weren't, and there were things like Icara frigates that would be no use down there. They, they had to offload their weapons and their fuel to us. And apparently they had some pretty damned awful trip back to England across the Bay of Biscay because they got rid of so much weight they were bobbing around like a cork. Oh, and, it, and it was a pretty uncomfortable trip back whereas we were laden with everything. So much ammunition we had to um, stuff things everywhere all over the ship. Uh, depth charges, bombs, whatever. So off we went. Uh, south, and of course at this stage we had no Hermes, um, no Invincible, it was just um, a couple of destroyers, Antrim, our sister ship, ourselves, and some frigates. And the idea was to get to Ascension, refuel, regroup, and go down and see what we could do before the carriers arrived. At this point, Admiral um, Woodward was in Antrim, but for some reason he chose to transfer his flag to us in Glamorgan and <clears throat> I became his staff weapons engineer officer for a few weeks as we transited down south. I remember we had 
a church service off Ascension on Ascension Day, which was a bit spooky. And um, I'm not too proud to say that I did pray um, <clears throat> for the ship and, and the lads. Um, because I hadn't been on board very long, I didn't know my team very well. And one of the things you've got to do as a leader is you've got to make sure they trust you and you've got to establish how much you can trust them. So it was a bit of a learning curve, basically remembering that we were trying to get ready to fight. And there wasn't a lot of time for anything else except preparing for this, what we thought was going to be a battle. Of course, we also thought that Maggie Thatcher and the Americans would have sorted this out before we got there, so we weren't sure. Uh, it all started for us on the 1st of May, which is the day the Vulcan came down, and I'll never forget the pilot's voice echoing around the ops room, saying he was going low. <clears throat> I'll talk to you in a few hours, to, or a couple of hours' time when, he, when I get back, because he'd had something like six refueling stops on the way down, and he still had six more to go back. And We went in uh, that morning um, <clears throat> to attack the airfield at Stanley with two frigates. We were bombed that morning, badly. The pilot had attacked us in, I think it was a Skyhawk. He tried to flick the two bombs onto the ship. He attacked us directly from the stern, but he overcorrected and the actual bombs crossed the flight deck and blew up, <coughs> excuse me, underneath the stern. And we became very unstable. And I remember a little squeaky voice in the ops room saying, I think we're going over. And a very deep voice said, no, we're not. Get on with your job, lad. So <laughs> there were some, you know, that was the first moment of humour I remember in war when the lad who was in the tiller flat where the steering gear is, sitting there all alone, ran, rumbling around at 28 knots, the whole ship shaking and cold and miserable. But that was his job, in case we got hit, was to look after the steering gear. And the bombs went off with it probably within a few feet of the ship's hull where he was. And the senior engineer phoned him up and said, are you all right, Smith? And if that was his name, I can't remember. And he said, yeah, I'm fine, sir. Is there anything you need? A clean pair of overalls, sir, be useful. <laughs> <laughs> so Jolly Jack was at it already. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we... We escaped. We didn't, you know, get hit by those bombs. From then on, we spent um, a lot of time thinking about the Belgrano, and she had a lot of exosets. And I, as I've said, was a bit worried about exoset. It's a very powerful weapon, but it can only do one thing, and that's to hit a target that it finds when it's flown about 10 miles of its 20-mile range, and it looks for... The first thing it can find it is what it'll hit. It can only fly at three heights above sea level, and they're fixed. I can't remember the exact heights, but we'll say they're 12 feet, 18 feet, and 25 feet, depending on the sea state, because you don't want to fly it through the waves. <clears throat> so I was worried about Exocet, and eventually, and it's a long story, uh, I convinced the captain that the only real way, if we couldn't shoot one down, is to make sure that we didn't take it in the side of the ship. If it came in, penetrated the side of the ship, I was pretty certain that we would disappear, rather like HMS Hood did in the Second World War. It would be a cataclysmic explosion, because the sea slug missile, boost missiles, if you touch them with a hammer, not touch them, if you strike them with a hammer, they will detonate. And they were the ones that were, the, were, were yeah. running along inside your About ship? About 300 feet long magazine and, you know, 60 tons of, of missile. Mm -hmm. uh, if the high explosive warhead went off, I mean, the, one of those would, would blow the ship up, let alone 30 of them. So I persuaded the captain after many hours of thought that we would be well advised if we ever saw an exocet coming towards us to either head it or, or take it on the stern. So we must turn towards or away at speed because if it hit the bow, it probably uh, the energy would be taken by the anchors and the cable locker, which is full of tons of big chain, or on the stern with the flash doors for the sea slug missiles, which are four inches thick. And even if it deflected and blew up, 90% of the energy would go up into the air. 
-hmm. not into the ship. The Exocet is a horrible missile. It's got some clever technology at the bow which uh, allows it to have 14 milliseconds to try and dig inside the ship and blow up inside, which, of course, is what it did with Sheffield. So I eventually got the captain to see that that was a pretty clever thing to do, and he did instruct all the officers if they ever saw one to, to do just that full speed and turn away or towards whichever was quickest. Um, we, we then spent weeks and weeks and we were, we were fighting for seven weeks except for the last two days. We were hit on the 12th of June. Most of the time we were supporting the army, uh, the Royal Marines, Paris, the Gurkhas, all the guys who were yomping across the islands. So what were you actually doing? You say defend, uh, helping and supporting. What were you actually doing? Right, we would go in um, at about, uh, sort of, shall we say, sort of evening time, and we would support uh, units of the of the ground forces as they advanced eastwards. There was one night I remember um, we would have spotters who would come on board to get briefed and they would be spotting for the army ashore. And there was one man who, every time he went on board a ship, it seemed to get sunk. Uh, but, and he came on board us, and we thought, oh, here we go, it's our turn. But there was one night where we were supporting the Royal Marine commander who, who were being pinned down by um, a machine gun unit. And they called for fire, which means they wanted us to take the machine gun out. <clears throat> and we put the first five rounds were in the air. We were standing off about five or six miles away, I think. And <laughs> you can hear his voice echoing around the ops room. And the, the, the little F word came out. You've hit it as though <laughs> he wasn't expecting us to, which was quite funny. So we check fired on that, and they, you could hear him running with the Royal Marine unit. You could hear him running, and then you could hear him as he hit the ground. Go on, there's another one, and he called for fire on that. And it's quite a complicated process to explain how you fire from a moving ship at a stationary target, which is not at the same height as you, and so on. But it's a very complicated um, system of, of computation. But would you believe we hit the second one with the second round? I mean, it was that quick. And when <clears throat> they got to the third machine gun, he said, the lads want to have a go at this themselves. So <laughs> they obviously had a, a hand portable uh, rocket or something. Um, but we were doing this all the time uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we'd be, sometimes it'd be, it was called the gun line, where you were steaming up and down. So whenever the army got stuck, we'd lay down some rounds I can't remember the figure I think we fired one and a half thousand rounds over the weeks um, and that's, that was for seven weeks yeah and the, I guess everyone was pretty tired yes there was, there was a bit more to explain when when you fired your guns for a little while uh, we would stay there maybe several hours or sometimes even longer all night then we'd make a run for it to the east to refuel rearm make sure we always had the uh, ammunition was fully topped up but the problem was that the sea states were very rough. And <clears throat> when you're doing 28 knots, you get a lot of water comes over the bow and drains, drowns the gun and everything. And you have to take the breech block out of the gun and, and clean it. And the breech block weighs, I'm, I'm guessing, half a quarter of a ton or something. It's a big bit of kit. It's very dangerous if you have that and the ship's rolling around. So we couldn't always lower the breach while we were going out. We had to wait until it was relatively calm. So then the lads were working all sorts of hours, you know, even when they were off watch. Because, of course, you fight at action stations and you, you, when you're at defence watches, half of you are trying to sleep or eat. So if you were off watch and, it was, and then you got an alarm, then you, suddenly you were back on watch. And so yeah. you, could do, you could sometimes spend two or three days where you didn't get any sleep. Um, and but you got used to it and, and adrenaline kicked in it was very interesting that nobody was seasick once normally in that ship you'd have 20, 30 people suffering in those sea conditions it mm -hmm. was rough mm -hmm. not one wow that's amazing 